Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay Moore. This is Greg Cruz. This is Bryce Vine. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan This is Sebastian Younger. This is Daryl This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. This is Dr. Bob Greenberg. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. This is Mark Pellington. I'm back on the Break It Down show. Happy to be here. All right. We're happy to have you. Mark Pellington is a director of features to include Going All the Way, Arlington Road, The Mothman Prophecies, I Melt With You, The Last Word, and most recently, Nostalgia. He made a name for himself creating videos for the likes of Leonard Cohen, De La Soul, Crystal Waters, PM Dawn, U2, Pearl Jam, Public Enemy, R.E.M., Allison Change, Nine Inch Nails, Dave Matthews, Michael Jackson, and the one I say for last, the disposable heroes of hip-hopracy. That's digging way back. Uh, way back. Who became uh, Spearhead. Spearhead. Michael Franti, yeah. That's right. That was the the disposable heroes of hip-hopracy video uh-huh. called Television Drug of a Nation. That's right. Television Drug, Drug of, of a, a Nation. Nation. Yeah. Feeding our son of idiots and all the eight-minute song. Yeah. Oh. Eight minute. We made a radical That's eight a minute anti TV music video, and it was very, it was a very like industrial sounding song. Very industrial. Early sounding. Early Michael Franti. Early Michael Franti and Ronote. We had done a um, spoken word. We became aware of him through doing a spoken word film, and also right around that time, he, they were opening for U two. I turned U two on to them. Wow. And that's how I did a bunch of stuff for Zoo TV. My friend saw the Disposable Heroes of Hypocrisy video, which dovetailed with a show I had done for MTV called Buzz, which is this, again, aggressively yes. edited Buzz. show in yeah. 1990. So that's what my friend showed Adam Clayton, and they were doing Zoo TV, and their idea was, oh, we're going to... And they, they've gone on record saying this. They basically copped a bunch of ideas from Buzz and that Disposable Heroes video, you know, wow. eyes, words, attack the media, yeah. right. pre-internet, really pre, pre-internet, pre and kind of bite the hand that feeds you. And a lot of that came from that Disposable Heroes video. That's yeah. terrific. I love hearing this story. Which I cut on an old tape-based three-quarter inch RM440 system, and the reason that the cuts were so fast is because that was kind of a system where you'd have to lay down a tape, and if you had a glitch, instead of laying it, doing it all over again, you just would cover up the glitch with another shot. So you're basically... Oh, so you're overlapping yeah. shots. You're overlapping, and just, it's just faster and faster because you're just lazy. Amazing. We did that at, uh, when I got my mass comm degree, when you wanted to edit like a video, you know, you had to edit, like change the song, like the picture on the beat, but in between, you just went tap, 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 sure. tap, 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 you know, and yeah, then yeah. you backed up, put another video in, tap, 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 yeah. tap. Yeah. Old school. <laughs> Old school. Old school. Yeah. That's yeah. just one step away from, you know, razor blade, mm -hmm. flatbed. Yeah, never edited film. Never edited. Saw some commercial. No kidding. Editors in like 1990 when I started doing. Not even in school, you never edited film. I never. Did you even I study film in school? No, not at all. You went to the University of Virginia. I studied yeah. um, partying. <laughs> Sweet lacrosse. Yeah. Right. I. Got good enough grades to graduate, mm -hmm. and there was one video class. I was a rhetoric and mass communications major, but they had no none of that stuff. I was into journalism and music, yeah. So that was my passion. They had one class, and I think my senior and I had already interned at MTV in the summer of '83. So MTV was like two years old. Yeah. So I interned no in the shit. summer of 83 in New York. In New York, yeah. Mm-hmm. I remember in the fall of 82, so I was there for my junior year, and this girl, Penny Bowers, I said, oh, what'd you do this summer? She goes, oh, I interned at MTV. I'm like, oh, man, that would be much so much fun, because that yeah. was the summer. Everybody just watched it all summer. Yeah. And so she goes, yeah, just write a letter. I wrote a letter to the woman, 
and I played lacrosse. So that spring we were up there playing in Long Island because a lot of the guys who played lacrosse were from Long Island. So we were up there, spring break, and uh, took a bus into, took a train into Manhattan, interviewed with a guy, Richie Zolachowski. So I'm 20. He was 21. Yeah. <laughs> this like punker from New Jersey, New yeah. Waver. And he goes, he looks at me, he goes, what kind of band? And I'm like wearing my like blue like blazer and my button down shirt. You were dressed for a job interview. Hell yeah, I was dressed and for a job interview. He was dressed was like to a, go to CBG. I was like a preppy from Baltimore. I'm like, job interview. He goes, what bands do you like? So I just, I said, I like Poly Rock, the Feelies, the Bongos, just, and I knew my shit. Yeah. I knew my shit pretty good. And I said, here's the seven last, my favorite seven records of the last month. And he goes, you're hired. Yeah, on the spot. Like, on the spot. And your shit. He goes, yeah, well, I mean, if, if you seem to be a decent person and you have good taste in music, that's half the that's battle. half the battle. Because then they're just like running you on errands and just, you're sure. doing, you know, but it didn't matter. He was a great guy. Wow. Still in touch? I think Facebook, I think maybe a year ago. Yeah. Huh. But like one of the early, early, early influences in my aesthetic life was a writer for a magazine called Trouser Press. Now, on the East Coast, you guys from the West Coast or East Coast? Yeah, West Coast. West Coast. Okay, East Coast, the rag, it was called Trouser Press, out of like northern Jersey, New York. This is late 70s, early 80s, was the first magazine that really covered new wave and mm. punk rock. Yeah. Like the singles, you could get a little flexi disc in it. Yes, you know, it yes. The flexi disc. And there was a writer named Tim Summer that would write these things and talk about these bands. And it was like the Bible to me. And I would go to the one record store in Baltimore that sold imports that got these and would go on the weekends and drive my mother's car and go there. I'm like 15 or 16 years old and go buy these things. So yeah. that became my Bible. Years later, Tim worked at MTV. And about five years ago, I did a video for a band called The Indecent. They since got dropped from Warner Brothers. Really cool. And ended up making like a 10-minute documentary and a video for them. And Tim Summer, the original, like the guy who first really like turned me on to this music, was their manager. And so Whoa. Tim was like 50, this is three years ago. Tim was 58. Yeah. I'm 56 now. So like yeah. this is, you know, 40 years after he had turned me on to music. Yeah. But this was a meeting that had been... You, the universe had been stewing on this for a while, forever. So I'm, just you know, I mean that that is the good thing about social media and yeah. and Facebook, especially is like all the old, all the old MTV MTV affiliated mm -hmm. people are all on there, and yeah. they all share, and they all. This guy Double D, who was one of our mixers, had this very very underground. Like, we would pre-mix, talking about cutting, we'd cut, take in vinyl and yeah. music and go pre-mix our tracks to cut promos to, and this guy Double D would do it on quarter-inch tape. So he'd take a little slice, and so he would make these mixes and these, like, pre-mixes that were early with, like, Bambata and, like, early, early pre-sampling, you know, kind of, like, late 70s, early 80s. Yeah. Seminal, like, just when... Um, rap was blowing up like in the Bronx and Grandmaster Flash and stuff like that. Right. So my mentor is a guy named Peter Doherty. He's the guy who hired me and he turned me on like, cause you know, those days it was like, Oh, this is, these are the beastie boys. And there was these kids running around and we'd go see him at Nassau Coliseum and like, Oh, here's my friend, Rick Rubin. This was before he Rob had a beard. Like when he had shoes. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, when he and he was a kid. <laughs> yeah. He was an NYU student and Russell Simmons and all these people were um, kids. Hip to the Beastie Boys when they were a punk band at all? Oh yeah, for sure. Okay, Cookie okay. Puss. Yeah. yeah. I mean I, I still have the twelve inch of Cookie Puss. Yeah. Which probably is worth something, I would think. Let's <laughs> hope. Wow. So then if we're uh following Jumping your progression time. from yeah, because man, this is fascinating yeah. shit no it, it's <laughs> oh, i want to ask you before we get out of this whole zone uh have you ever worked with ali willis as an art director for your videos at all mm -hmm. you, are you aware of ali willis is then 
I know the name. She wrote September for Earth, Wind, and Fire. She wrote Boogie Wonderland, and then about a thousand other songs. Wow. She's in the Songwriter Hall of Fame. But she wow. got into, and once you know how, how how this town is, they're like, oh, you can write songs. Here, write this song. Write this song. Write this. And sure. you're just like, fuck, I hate writing songs. Wow. So she got more into the. Uh, and she's like an uber artist, like any kind of media, any kind of. Allie thing. Willis, name rings a bell, but have not. If I showed you her picture, you'd be like, oh, yeah, that lady. She's a kooky lady. I saw it. She looks like the kooky lady down the street who, you, you know, you see her drive by and you go, I'm positive that lady has 12 cats. Kooky lady. Yeah. And she she's just lovable as hell, yeah. man. We love her. Okay. If we're going back to uh, that point in your career, how on earth did you make that Disposable Heroes video? How did that come about? Uh, how, did I, so how did I meet Michael? Um... It was through Island Records, through a woman named Judy Troilo, and I had done a video for an artist, God, for Island, it was before, I'd have to really look. Yeah, that's going back, huh? This might be right after PM Dawn. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'd done PM Dawn for Island, Mm -hmm. Set Adrift on Memory Bliss. And I know they were on the same label. Yeah. And I'm trying to get, I know it's early 90s, but like. Right, the timing's right. Zoo TV and then Public Enemy. Yeah. So. They also yeah. opened for U2 around that time. Who did? Public Enemy opened for U2 for one sure. of those tours, yeah. Um, yeah, so it was all around that. It was all around that time. That label and that group yeah, of Yeah, Islands. Yes, yeah. Island. Chris Blackwell and Islands. Yeah. So it was like, I think it was no money. But I remember shooting. Boy, Allen Allen Records did pretty well for themselves. Yeah, <laughs> they spent no money on all of that stuff. Yeah, Chris Blackwell. Yeah, I wonder if he's still alive. I think he is. He's. I'm doing cut full circle to. Now I loved reggae. Like uh-huh. I loved Bob Marley. Okay. My father had a house in the Bahamas, so when we grew up, we would spend a lot of time there. Okay. In a little island in the Bahamas. So spend a lot of you know, you spend a lot of that time. That was your there. family vacation home. Yeah, and we would spend Christmases there and like on a tiny island and hang out like in the Let's village. Just take so a like pause we, for one second though. Yeah. Your dad played twelve years in the NFL for the yeah, Baltimore Colts. Baltimore Colts, sure. Wow. How is he still around? No, he died. Oh, Doc. Okay. Um how much CT. of CT. How much yeah, CT, yeah. Shit. Of course. Yeah, man. How much of your career did he see? He saw, I'll never forget, 1985, I had been in MTV for a year, and I made this promo made up of just images from a bunch of, you know, you'd see all the videos would come in every week, they'd yeah. call them image reels, like, here's 15 videos, and here's 12 videos, and you'd look at them all, because our job was to make promos in between videos, and I would see, like, all these videos that never got played, English videos, like, really cool things, and so I started making these promos by taking cool shots from all the different videos that never got seen cutting them up and putting them with some text and other audio and making like a collage i had Uh no idea what a collage was it was just how my brain worked like oh if i take these things i can kind of make it my own without shooting something which is experimenting a little yeah because it was non-linear it's like visual sampling yes very much so and but this was like 1984 Mm mm-hmm and MTV was like always promoting itself pretty traditionally at that time, like tune in this week or tune in next week for sneak preview videos. Right. Like all their on air marketing was, you know, it was kind of like more humor based. And so I made this thing, and my boss, Marcy Braffin, was a, she had been a painter and a video artist who was hired by MTV to be like run promos and make the little 10 second weird eye dents and make them like weird arty little yeah. 10 second things hire animators so she had a sensibility for that but she hired so when i made this thing i said i want to make this stuff and she goes oh you want to make a collage and i was like oh what's the collage so she turned me on to that which oh you learn about that you learn about dadaism you learn about different kind of art forms i had never studied art history it's like oh that's kind of interesting so i made the promo and it was the first promo that really like promoted MTV in a more of just a mood or emotion way. Uh-huh. Like, I remember Bob Pittman, the head of MTV at the time. I still have the the, the internal email, like the, the memo that he sent that congratulated me after he had said he had no idea what it was. It was. 
Right. Because what is this garbage? And then they played it, and people loved it. This is just a little 30-second promo. Yeah, yeah but go, it was one of the early seminal things. I was still a production assistant. For... Mm-hmm. I was a production assistant. And I just made this, and they said, oh, keep making things like this. And I remember about six months later, I won some award. And my father and mom came up on a train oh, right. from Baltimore. And I remember, and my dad was still fine then, this 1985. And my mom said he was more proud of that than any sports award I had ever won. Because it was something like he couldn't do. Yeah. So, yeah, I think I would go home. I lived in New York. I'd go home on a fairly regular basis. And he was always like, hey... You know, and How's it going, catching up with you, seeing what you were up to? Yeah, and he was very... Because you had gone into a different world. Gone into a different world. But by 1988, he began to show the signs hmm. of dementia. Oh, and by wow. 80, by the end of 88, he was checked out. Wow. Like he didn't recognize me. That's terrible. So I made a documentary about him. That's right. And um, made a documentary about that struggle and that, you know... Um, Still trying to do a feature version of it, actually, which is long road, but that's a different story. Yeah. But um, yeah, no, he was super. He was, he was into it, you know. Yeah. Supportive. It's neat when you see your kid blossom in a way that you couldn't have, you know, it, you didn't Absolutely. go down a road that he took you down. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So we were talking about your your family place in the Bahamas and how that. Got you into reggae. Oh, right. And then full circle, Next, in two days, I'm going to Miami to shoot a video for Damien Marley. No kidding. And it's a great song uh, called Autumn Leaves. A friend of mine said, hey, I'm looking for a director for this video. And I'm like, I'll do it. I like him. It's very like Nat King Cole kind of. It's kind of a ballad. Mm-hmm. It's great. Great mood. And I okay. like, yeah, I'll go. And like, I... Loved Bob Marley. I yeah. Said, I feel spiritually like a good... Connection with... Kind of, yeah. And I'm thinking about it. I've got the weekend off of Miami. And I was thinking about going... My father's house got destroyed by a hurricane in 89. So he couldn't go there anymore. You know, but his de- So his dementia, like... Right. He couldn't go there anymore. And the house got destroyed by Hurricane Andrew. So it was like... It was fitting that... Uh, you know, the the demise of the physical structure and the demise of the mental structure coincided. Kind of went at the same time, yeah. Yeah, but I was thinking about maybe I'd just take a flight over there. Just go look at it. Yeah. A little bit of closure. Do you guys still own the land? No, we sold it eventually after we realized the Bahamian government was so fucked up. that like, <laughs> the taxes, like, it was ridiculous. The amount of back taxes on almost canceled out the... Value, the value of, of the property. Yeah. yeah, we had a lot of good years there, so it was worth it. Was worth it. Yeah, wow. Yeah. So Damian Marley, this song that you're doing, do you have when you take on a project like this? Have you had conversations about uh, concepts for the video already? How does that collaboration work? Each one is different. Sometimes they're collaborations. Sometimes they're just here's the track, write what I just listened to it and. If I like the track, my brain will just go and I'll just just start seeing stuff and just start pretty much free associating and something very clear comes to me and I'll just write it down. So every artist is going to give you a different amount of latitude. Maybe they have a vision already. Maybe Sometimes they have nothing. Sometimes Demi, Lov- Demi Lovato, she had an idea, mm-hmm. which I interpreted. Imagine Dragons, They, I just wrote a real like nine page kind of huge hallucinatory story about it and send it to them. And sometimes they're just <laughs> like, go man. Other times they're very, the best ones are where they're like collaborative enough to like not get in the way. Right. Yeah. Same way. If I'm doing a song, I'm doing a movie and I say, we do a song for the movie. You're like, here's the scene. Here's the context. Do it. See ya. I'm not uh, a songwriter. Yeah. Right. 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 And they're not directors. But we, you work it out, you know what I mean? Yeah. So they wanted to be in it. So we created this little... St- each one is different. Damien was really... He was kind of blown away how into the song I was. Because it, like, it meant a lot more. He wrote it as like a love song. But to me, it was like, you know, just wherever I am in my life, it was a much deeper questioning of some things. And I just Did I he, really liked it. Yeah. And, and, and he was he got some feedback from you... 
about the song that he probably hadn't. Yeah, he. You know, his last one was kind of like a bunch of people partying around the thing. You know, it's like. So I wrote this thing as a little more. He goes, oh man, like things a lot deeper. I said, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's and time. I, and I talked. <laughs> I probably just talked extemporaneously for like two minutes about the feeling and the metaphors and da 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 the spiritual. He goes, God, man, that's the most beautiful thing you could ever say about it. Like, great. Come on down to Miami. <laughs> so, like, you think this song is better than I think it is. <laughs> yeah. Well, all he's got to do is all he's got to do is sing the song. It's like Bruce Springsteen. Like you just. He goes, "What do you want me to do?" I said, "I just want you to sing the song. No band, no mic." He sings live vocals, which is he's the only artist that sings, record live vocals, and mm-hmm. you mix them with the instrumental track as opposed to just like lip syncing. Yeah. So, um, just. Be authentic and sing the song. That's all you have to do. I'll do the rest of it. Terrific. And that's like telling him just to be alive. Yeah. Because that's all he can do. He's what like, should I do? You should breathe in and out. Uh-huh. And he loved it. And this I remember when he called. We finished it. This for a lonesome day. And he called me. This was like 8.30. 8.30 on a Saturday night. I was in my old house. My previous life, 2002. And the phone rings, and I pick, phone rings, like, okay. Uh-huh. Yeah, <laughs> right. Line, yeah. Phone rang. Yeah. Uh-huh. I pick it up, and I said, he goes, hey, Mark, Bruce. Hey, all right, hold on a sec. We're getting ready to do Saturday. They were getting ready to do Saturday Night Live. Wow. Right, they were, like, and I, <laughs> at I that moment. Thing, and I was like, no, it was like, I was like, wait, this is like 845. Shit. Like, he's That's right. right. <laughs> he's, he's recording. He's at the studio. He's on, he's at Saturday Night Live. You know, they'd have an opening, a skit. Yeah, and right. these were the first artists we play about twenty minutes in, right? Yeah, and he had a string tied to his finger. Oh, I was supposed to call Mark. So he, <laughs> so he goes, "Oh, I gotta go. <laughs> Hold on." And his wife gets on the phone, Patty. Patty, yeah. She says, "I just gotta tell you, Bruce has never been sexier and more down to earth than in the video." Cool. She hangs up. Twenty minutes later, he had played this. Calls back. Goes, "Hey, look, I had two notes. He gave me two notes for the video." I edited them. Like four days later, he calls. He goes, "Ah, make him change it back the way it was." Right, because he gave you the two notes and then hung up the phone. And Patty said, "What in the hell are you doing?" Yeah, <laughs> no, I love that video. Them, You've never been him. sexy. Yeah, they look at him. It's like, you're, and this was like a multiple shots. And like, yeah, Jim, he was he was pretty amazing to work with. That's terrific. I'm so glad to hear that because lately we've had tremendous luck with all of these stories about works of art that mean something to us or artists that mean something to us or they given us some something that was some important part of our you know it, learning experience growing up or something and then to hear that you know no that guy's a great guy and and really took care of us and really took care of making sure that we were a part of the process or things like that that oh. man to hear that is just magical okay, i got a great anecdote for you nice so we do Lonesome Day, everything goes great, right? A few years later, they're like, we want to do um, girls in their summer clothes, right? So it was another mm-hmm. Springsteen video. And they said, um, great, well, why don't you come to Jersey? Like the other one, we had shot the other one in Jersey. It's great, okay, sure, we'll come down, we fly to Jersey, stay in Red Bank, which is right near Rumson, where he's from. You know, uh-huh. right, well, Red Bank's like, Makes Marina del Rey look big. Yeah. It's kind of like a San Pedro, but smaller. Right. right. Wow. East Coast, just. We're in the motel. It's like right on the water, kind of dinky place. You're in the lobby. That's cool. And the phone rings. Mm. And they're like, yeah, yeah. Here's this phone ringing again. No, no, phone. Yeah. And, I, and the guy at the desk is like, oh, no, this isn't some fancy hotel. Yeah. Gets, oh, there's a call for you over there. So you go to the house phone over in the. Yeah. And like pick it up. Hello? Hey, Mark, it's Bruce. How was your flight? He's got every great. place's number. Right? Yeah. Great. I was great. Good. Okay, cool. Everything's good? You guys are all good? Yeah. Like like you're there for, you're like Uncle Larry's calling. You're there for the wedding, right? Yeah. <laughs> Take, making sure you guys great. got in Let's all right. Let's go look at some, exactly. That's yeah. what he said. He said those exact words. We'll go look at some locations tomorrow. I'll pick you up around nine. Pick you up. We'll go to uh, some places I want to show you. Cool. Nine o'clock next morning, we're like we're in the lobby, we're like 
Rock stars don't get up at 9 o'clock nah, in the morning. I was morning. like, like who's going to... Is he going to be in an SUV? Blah, blah, blah. These people... Gold caddy. <laughs> Convertible. <laughs> Pulls up. He, he's in it. Gets out. Walks in the lobby. Hey, how you doing? Get in the thing. Drive around. Look at some locations. Done? In a convertible gold Cadillac. Yeah, just, he's just driving around. And like, people at the stoplight, people are like, hey, Bruce. He's like, how you doing? Yeah. Like, just, that was his town. Terrific. But that's like, he was totally unpretentious. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. And that He did is, have every place's phone number. And that <laughs> is his, but that's his vibe, man. That's his, I think he could walk down the street. People wouldn't be, there'd be a lot of people there, but that's just his jam. Amazing. Working class, right? Yeah, that's right. What about He's being him? I'm curious because you two does so many things and so many different media, and you've done work on several th- projects with them. Mm-hmm. How involved are they in the vision, or do they just kind of say, "Here's what Very we want"? Very involved. Okay, because it seems because they've got. Today's show is brought to you by our friends over at WeFixYourScript.com. Jeff, who runs the thing, is a friend of mine and someone I believe in deeply. If you've got an idea, if you've got half a script on on like a Word document somewhere, Jeff is your guy. He does a 15-minute free consultation. Here's what happens. The people that work with Jeff, their scripts, they win awards. Most importantly, what that means is the script is out of your head. It's not something you want to do. It's done, and you've got it in front of people that want to buy ideas. If you're going to write a script, talk to Jeff. At least it's free. It's 15 minutes and he will get you going in the right direction. Now enjoy the show. I don't want to say a pattern, but you can tell. Yeah, there's continuity. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's right. Continuity. Well, the first time I did this stuff for Zoo TV, they picked people. They cherry picked people. I had done Buzz. They, they picked my partner on Buzz. He did some stuff. Then he turned out to be like an ass clown. Then they hired me, and I did a bunch of stuff. Then I wasn't available, and they went to the other guy who had worked on the show. And they just they just they find good artists and let them do their thing. Mm-hmm. And when then years later, I did some more stuff for them and stayed in touch. And then my friend they wanted to do the three D film. Yeah. And my friend Catherine Owens, who had hired me to do the other stuff, great artist, great director. They were insecure about her being able to direct it. You know, I think because she was a woman and she didn't have that much experience. So they said, will you direct it with her? I'm like, sure. I mean, it's like nine cameras. It's not, you're not cutting it live. You're just, it was not hard. Yeah. To do it, I was just to help her. My job was to help her get the images. She edited it for a year. And then just even up until about a year ago, I stayed in touch Went and consulted with them on some stuff. Wrote a couple of ideas for them about something. Yeah. Didn't work out, you know. They just asked me a few months ago. I was in New York doing a pilot. And they asked me if maybe would I be interested in doing something with some the kids from Parkland. You know, the gun or what did I think about stuff. And just, you know, they they just like to, they like, they're like family and they like, they like their people. Yeah. You know? They're going to bring somebody in who shares a vision and, and then and, give them some space. But they're loyal. Yeah. They're loyal and they're just good people. That's good to hear. Again, I think when I did, you know, they were there. I had lost my wife in 2004. And so in 2005, when the opportunity to do the film come up, my daughter was two. And so we're like maybe 10 months out. Now, I hadn't traveled. I had not traveled at that point. I had not left her. I had not left her with anybody. You know, she was two and a half. Yeah. And almost three. And I remembered having this long conversation with Bono about you know, loss and life and, you know, that kind of thing about moving sure. forward. Not like, oh, moving on, but just like moving forward. And that conversation kind of helped so I said yes, and I moved forward. And all, it, would only, it was only like a week away, but at that point, that was a big, a big deal. Yeah. It was a big deal. And I remember sitting there. It was mostly in South America, but there was a little stop in Mexico City on the way for one of the gigs, right? Okay. And I remember in Mexico City being down, so the audience is there, and there's a barricade, you know, not that big of a barricade, and you're down here overseeing one of the crane cameras, right? Because there was only two 3D cameras. 
and they only in South America had seven cameras for two shows, mm. but all the other shows they could only do like two in Mexico City, one camera in Chile. Like that's all they had. This was right. not like, hey, we're gonna. Now it'd be like, yeah, we can carry 3D cameras like they're butter, right? Right. That wasn't the point then. So in Mexico City, you're testing these two cameras out, and as they played and they came out, and you're like, oh. I don't know if you, you've, I'm sure you've been in the front row or like pretty close and. Well, this was incredible, and Latin American audiences are crazy, yeah, rabid, yeah, and the the vibe was so intense that I remembered looking back and feeling literally like a life force, and I was like, I was grateful to him. I told him that night. I said, I'm really grateful that you. Then I said, Yes, because this is you know you have to do that. You felt eighty thousand people singing a. You know, a song. Yeah. You can't 80, help. 80,000 people worth of togetherness. You can't help but realize there's something larger than you. Mm, Do you know right. what I mean? So something larger than, you know, that makes you, it's not like, oh, I understand why someone dies, but you're, you're in that plane. And when you're in deep, that kind of heavy grief like that and fear, you're not thinking about, you know, hey, that there's 80 million people at a, 80,000 people at a concert, and that life goes on. Yeah. So that was uh, that was my heavy. gift. That was the gift that he gave me um, in that particular time in my life. Wow. Yeah. Loss and bereavement, and this is a human emotion that you've really kind of dedicated quite a bit of exploration to. Certainly the last 13 years of, and uh, certainly so there was, like I said, there was the life before and the life after, and it wasn't by choice that, you know, you're drawn to what you're drawn to. There certainly, there was a lot of other movies I was interested in making that weren't about that, yet they never, they didn't happen. They yeah. didn't get greenlit, or they didn't just come together in a way that it was it wasn't a conscious choice that... I only want to make these kinds of movies. Certainly, some of the TV stuff I've done has no isn't that isn't that at all like Blind Spot and this new pilot I just did. But that that's fine. Do you know what I mean? I think as like as a filmmaker and artist, you're just like stuff comes to you and you want to do it. And but I think the last movie, Nostalgia, kind of closes a chapter. Kind of closes a chapter on that. Wow. I'm definitely. It's taken a lot of years, but. I'm definitely ready to make other kinds of things now. Like I'm, I'm less drawn, I'm less drawn to that. Um, you, as an you don't feel as much as you th that you have to work it out you know, anymore. Thirteen years is a long time, man. Yeah, it's a long time. It's a long time. It's a long time in an artistic life too. Yeah, and it's a long time in, and it, it's not like. Ticket goers are breaking down doors to come to my the sad dark movies or mm. the comedies that deal with it. You know, it's like it's okay. Like you know, you, you realize also you, like you're not making movies. You're not making movies for. You know, it's like you're not making the movies for the Marvel universe. You just like you just do a body of work, and whether it's a short film or a music video or a documentary, or just you just keep doing. You have your body of work. Yeah. Talk to guys like you and just say, keep making them and you'll get an email. You'll get a letter from, you get an email from somebody who's like, I got an email two days ago from somebody who was on a plane that saw nostalgia and like how it had right. spoken to her and her life and just like, great. I mean, I get that all the time. You get emails and notes and cards and, you know, you just, you're drawn to what you're drawn to. Yeah. And well, it, it's a great ahead. thing about the medium because you get to do something that isn't you know as opposed to a live experience which is great and often moving when you get to capture it on celluloid it's there for ever forever yeah so now it'll be some piece of data on some sort of streaming thing but that's that's great yeah do you know what i mean so the 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 methodology the methodology changed. So great. It used to be Blockbuster. Mm -hmm. And so when there's, there was physical media, you can go to Blockbuster. Yeah. Great. We could go to Blockbuster and see anything we want. And that was the way we lived. That's the way we thought that we would digest movies. Right? 
And yeah. then suddenly, like, hey, you know what? We don't. Suddenly, your computers don't have the ability to play discs. <laughs> that's, yeah. why I'm, that's why I'm carrying around like a reel of stuff <laughs> on a thumb drive. On a thumb drive. Yeah. Which is like, hey, here's my work. We were given a screener and Blu-ray, and I'm like, what am I supposed to do with this? You know. I, now, I personally, now obviously as an older guy, I lament that loss. But you could see from okay, my house, or if you come to my office, like. Or nostalgia dealt with that. It's like, I still have my vinyl. I listen to it. I have my cassette tapes. Yeah. I just always just joke with my daughter. It's like, she's just going to have to have to get a warehouse one day to store all the stuff, you know? Yeah. That's fun. Yeah, I was talking, I did answer the question on Cora about um, music licensing and listening. This person wanted to get their money back from iTunes because now they listen to the music on Spotify. And I'm like... Let me tell you how many times I bought this album. I bought the album, the cassette, the cassette. My girlfriend stole the cassette, so I bought the cassette again. Oh, they they wanted their money back? Yes! Yes. I'm like, you know how many media you're going to go through in your life and ways you're going to pay for this thing? Yeah. Shit, come over to my office and go through. I had this girl. She was a family friend. She was like 20, 21. She was making some extra money going through my... really helped me organize my office and my, like, cassettes and alphabetizing my CDs. And there were some... I had CDs in there. I had unopened CDs, box sets of CDs that I had gotten from 1995 at Warner Brothers when I go for a meeting. Hey, can we go to the vault? And you go in there and you leave with bags of CDs. Yeah. Like, hey, can I? I really need this box. And that was an Bob, awesome day. Bob Dylan box set. No, literally shit was unopened. And I said, and she took a bag of stuff to Amoeba. Uh-huh. She ended up getting like 85 bucks for it, for all the CDs. Yeah, crazy. That was, for her, that's, that was a lot of bread. Yeah. But I was like, it answered your question. Yeah. I'm not going to get twelve ninety nine no. back for the eagle-eyed cherry <laughs> CD no. with one good song. And that's why the record oh, companies man. got fucked, because they yeah. started like selling shit with only one good Yes. I was and glad CD you singles it. never took off. Yep. Right. And radio was pumped. It's like, wait a second. This whole album is not good at right. all. Yeah. yeah remember when they would have cherry, listening stations? Nena Cherry. Yeah. Between the two of them, they got one song. Yeah, exactly. Do you remember they would have the listening station? Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Like it, I used to love going to Virgin yeah. on Crescent Heights and Sunset. And you would go. Yeah. And like, you could go listen. At least you're like, okay, hey, I had heard that song on radio. Listen to a few and be like, oh, do I want to? Right. Do I want to drop fourteen ninety nine for a CD? Yeah. Did that many many times. Yeah. You're right though that that is. I mean, if we want to look at the origin of where record companies started to get fucked, it's because consumers were tired of getting fucked. Yes, early to mid nineties because then it was in the later. Mid post mid nineties, that MTV started deteriorating. Yeah, and MTV basically started to die in as a result of the record companies dying. Yeah, and not and MTV said, "Oh, we're gonna start playing shows." Yeah, and yeah, that was really the death of it. Man, beginning of it. It took. Many more years, I think it became... Technology had to get caught up with that movement. And then YouTube and, you know, but they monetized the videos. Now they get record... I was talking to the head of Julie Greenwald, the head of Atlantic. She's like the big top dog there. Because I was talking about doing long-form stuff and how do you, like... Janelle Monet had made this 48-minute film. Uh-huh. And I've made some longer films for, like, yeah. smaller artists and, you know, like, 50-minute things. I'm like, oh, they're not features. What are they? And you got to find the right artist that has the vision for that kind of thing yeah she was like she's like yeah you have to she goes but you monetize them she goes we we through youtube Mm -hmm. you know so if there's like millions and billions of hits yeah they get a little they get a little taste from a little taste what the directors don't they should yeah they absolutely one one hundredth of one percent right yeah a billion we heard about a Video that's played over a billion times. A billion times. Is that Miami one that lay whatever the No. The one that won the Grammy. It's some kids kids video from uh South Korea. Yeah. 
and it's one of those, you know, K-pop artists. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. BTK or but something like that, yeah. It's not the, like, teenage K-pop. It's kid, the kid, kid yeah. K-pop. Yeah. So there's even less of that, and the kids are even more attached to it and watch it more repetitively because they're six. A billion? Six. I, I, I'm saying, uh, I think it was several billion. Yeah, it was It was a, a number that was more than one. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? But, I mean, how many people are, are on the planet? How many movies do you have to make to get a billion people to look at it? You know, like, it's just... It's, I don't know. We're still at four billion, right? Four I, think billion we're, people? I think we're north of six. Oh, maybe se- Okay, approaching but way, seven though. billion. But that's nearly every person mm-hmm. on the planet having watched this thing. And since we know that yeah. not to be true... right. That means everybody in Korea watched that thing many times. Thousands yeah. of times. Yeah. yeah. John's wife's got a uh, viral video with multi millions of hits. She's... It's, uh, we were, I, my kids played baseball. And so we were at an all star tournament where one of the kids who grew up with my son, and, you know, he was the kid who, he's at Arizona State now, just a fine young man. But he grew to his adult size before everybody else. So he was a big kid. And there was a situation where a pitcher in an all-star t- on an all-star team had to intentionally walk him because he was a home run hitter. And they were in a situation where if he hits something deep now, the runs are going to come in that take us above 10, and there was a 10-run rule. So it was Got like, it. we can't let any of these runs score. You have to put that kid on. And I guess they came from a league where if the coach just said, put that kid on, you put the kid on. But now we were in the all-star environment. So the rules were, no, he's got to throw the pitches. So it's a kid who has to intentionally walk somebody, and he's never intentionally walked somebody Sure, before. so he throws it like just slow and... Yeah, yes. so he throws what he remembers an intentional walk looks like in the major leagues, which to him is like, I'm going to throw these four pitches and you're going to let them go by you. Yeah, yeah. Meanwhile, my wife is behind the dugout and she's, she's filming the game on her phone and you can hear her say, that was pretty close. Hey, Jay, you could hit that. And he watched another one sail by. And then he decided that he agreed. <laughs> if it gets any closer, I'm taking a hack. And he throw and the kid, you know, he just lobs it over mm-hmm. and the ball just gets crushed. He hits the ball into the <laughs> next zip code. So she posts the video on YouTube and the comments just went crazy. I mean, it was Cannot just like, stop. yeah, did the kid drive like the bus Lee there? From, uh, Bad yeah. Bears. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Smoking a cigarette. I'm a positive that there was at least... Yeah, there were probably a hundred Kelly Leak comments. Yeah. But, yeah, there's eight million views on that video. Eight million, Jesus Christ. And then later on, when the kids matured a little further, my kid was playing in a tournament down here in Huntington Beach. Um, and that kid was on the team that played that tournament as well. We had kind of gotten attached to some of the families because we traveled together. You know, when the when a youth sport sure. team family start to travel together. Sure, you bond. Yeah. And then at some point, somebody mentioned that video. And we were like, you know, you know that's Jason. And everybody's like, wait, what? And one of the younger siblings runs to the dugout. Hey, you guys, you know the video of the kid hitting the home run off the intentional walk? And every single person in the dugout was like, of course, we know that video. And they were like, dude, that's your teammate. Viral video star. Yeah. yeah. That's it. It's all downhill. <laughs> all down. It's all downhill. Yeah. Yeah. Thankfully, the, that kid was completely unaffected by that, and he's a great kid. Good. He's going to make somebody a wonderful husband, provider, all that stuff. Let's get back to the artistic process, though, uh-huh. because the viral video is great. It's almost like reality TV. You just fucking trip and fall into that sometimes. Yeah in life and it takes more than that to actually have a vision that moves people emotionally.